So welcome to this uh, second session of uh, this wonderful conference. Many of us were always convinced that uh, research is for all functions of a central bank or a prudential authority. And if, if not yet clear to you, then this conference is proof of that. So the tradition that only monetary policy is researched, we have left long behind us. So we have a nice session. So I thinking about what kept these three papers of this session together. I was thinking is that they all talk a little bit about um, uh, how problems that you may think could be limited to individual institutions actually could be systemic. So we're gonna start with an empirical paper about cyber risk when an a, a IT services company that serves many banks um, has a cyber attack and how that affects uh, the banking system as a whole. Then we're gonna go to a theoretical, more theoretical contribution about cross-border banking where the regime of, um, the regime of how um, like ring fencing and or cross-border support is dealt with, how what the attitude of the supervisory authority is, has an impact um, about the efficiency and allocation of capital and so on. And then third, we turn back to something more empirical that has a bit of a flavor of the first paper of today. Uh, but this time it's not about Colombia, it, this time it's about Europe. So it's about the forward-looking provisioning uh, in, in Europe. So I'm very curious to see, I try to read like what the differences and similarities are with the, with the first paper. But uh, let, let, we're probably gonna discuss that. So uh, let me call the first speaker to the floor. I think it's Antonis Cotides, actually. And, um, uh, so with the paper on the cyber attacks, your floor is yours. You have 20 minutes. Please, everybody stick to time. Thank you. Excellent. So first of all, let me uh, thank uh, the organizers for uh, including this paper in this conference. It's an important conference. Uh, I should also say, unfortunately, I'm not there with you. Um, uh, I, I would love to, but family reasons kept me back in Washington. Um, let me start by uh, introducing a little bit myself. I'm uh, Antonis Cotelis. I'm an economist at the board. This is joint work with uh, Stacy Schreff. Stacy is a deputy director of research in the OFR at the US Treasury Department. Uh, given our affiliations, the usual disclaimer uh, applies. So I will um, start my presentation with a very simple fact. The fact is that at the time of unprecedented digital transformation of the global financial system, a new threat to financial stability has emerged, cyber attacks. And everyone seems to be worried. Our policymakers are concerned that a cyber attack would trigger financial crisis. Academics have emphasized cyber attacks as a financial stability risk, and um, some of them even call for more cyber monitoring and even more macroprudential regulation. And at the same time, industry participants consistently cite cyber risk as a top risk in surveys. Uh, yet, to the best of our knowledge, there's no paper of an actual cyber attack that potentially threatened financial stability. So what we do in this paper is that we study an actual multi-day cyber attack, which is uh, fairly representative of many others in the nature of the attack, on a major technology service provider. Uh, neither today nor in the paper, I'm gonna tell you which DSP was impacted. I'm not gonna tell you when the attack happened. I'm not gonna tell you how long it lasted for. What I will tell you though, is that given the size and scale of operations of this DSP globally, that was potentially a financial stability event. What happened? As soon as the TSP discovered evidence of an attack on its computer network, it disconnected affected servers from the internet in order to contain the attack. The banks that were relying on this TSP in order to connect and send payments over Fedwire, which is the main payment system in the United States, immediately lost their ability to do so. At the same time, uh, other banks that were relying on alternative TSPs in order to connect and send payments over Fedwire uh, were doing business as usual. So what we do here is that we study the financial stability effects of this event as well as contagion through the payment system. Why the payment system? Because it is a common yet crucial transmission channel for stress in the financial system, as we know from past literature. So if you had access to uh, the raw Fedware data, probably the first thing to do would be to just plot the payment activity by users of the TSP and non-users of the TSP before, during, and after the cyber attack. So that's exactly what I showed you here. On the left, you see the number of payments by uh, users in blue, and non-users in red before, during, and after the cyber attack. And on the right, you see the value of payments. Uh, on the x-axis, we have days. The Fedware data is daily data. Uh, however, you don't really see days. All you see is equal zero, which is the first day of the event. And this is because we want to protect a little bit of sensitivity if you want of the event. And you may have also noticed that both lines on the y-axis have been normalized, so they both start from one. Again, this is in the spirit of protecting the confidentiality of the event. 
Despite our interventions to the raw data, there are some key takeaways from these graphs. One, the greatest disruption was on the first day of the attack, which is depicted by the first vertical, red vertical dashed line. And consistent with the idea that banks switched to alternative ways in sending payments after the TSP uh, went down, and the TSP gradually restoring services for these users, we see some gradual normalization, both in terms of the number and in terms of the value of payments on subsequent days. And importantly, we see very similar trends in payment activity of users and non-users, both before but also after the cyber attack. And I'm saying this is important because it gives us confidence when we plot the raw data that the divergence that we observe uh, during that period can in principle be attributed to the cyber attack itself and not potentially of anything else that are uh, potentially happening at the same time. Okay, so before I start digging deeper into like the findings of this paper and what we do, I think it is important to just fix ideas. So, um, so what I show you here uh, is a concept, what I'm going to present is a conceptual framework that's going to inform our empirical analysis. So this is a typical Fedwar trading day, okay? So starting from the far left, we have bank one. Bank one sends $100 payments to bank two and bank three. And as soon as banks two and three receive $100 payments from bank one, they go ahead and send $100 payments each to bank four. Bank four on the far right, as soon as it receives $200 payments combined by banks two and three, it goes ahead and send $200 payments back to bank one, and this completes the picture. Now, the devil here is in the details. What exactly do I mean when I say that bank one sends $100 payments to bank two? Practically speaking, it means that staff in bank one are sending in front of a software which has been purchased by the TSP. Okay, they log in with their credentials and their passwords, and they're able to connect to Fedware and send Fedware payments. Okay, the problem, the problem is that the software is not working anymore. Exactly because the TSP just just uh, uh, disconnected affected servers on the internet in order to contain the attack. Well, for bank two, this is not a problem because it's not a user of the TSP. However, for bank three, although bank three is still receiving $100 from bank one, exactly because bank one is able to send $100 payments to bank three, bank three cannot log in anymore to the Fedwire and can, as a result, cannot send $100 payments to bank four. Okay? A mechanical effect here is that it's reserves that it has at the Fed are going to jump from $50 to $150. That's a mechanical effect, and we have it in the paper, okay? Now, the interesting part is what happens with Bank 4 on the far right. Bank 4 now only has access to $150, $50 as reserves and $100 receiving from, from, from Bank 2 in order to make a payment of $200 back to Bank 1. So unless Bank 4 finds an alternative source of funding, which in this case, since reserves are not enough, uh, can either borrow from the interbank market or from the discount window, uh, Unless it finds an alternative source of funding, uh, then Bank 4 uh, will only be able to make a payment of $150 back to Bank 1. And you see how the initial shock to a technology service provider affecting uh, and propagating uh, through the rest uh, of the system. So when I will refer to the first round effect, I will essentially be comparing the differential payment activity uh, of Banks 2 and 3. When I will refer to the second round effect, I will study the incoming payments of Bank 4. And when I will uh, refer to the third round effect, I will study the outgoing payments of Bank 4, okay, which is um, uh, this propagation of the rest of the system. So starting with the first round effect, I will ask two very simple questions here. Okay, The first one is, what share of all Fedware payments would have been lost had zero payments gone through? Remember what I said earlier. When the TSP went down, banks actually did switch to alternative ways in sending payments, which were more manual and time consuming. Okay. So this counterfactual exercise here is going to give us an upper bound estimate of what would have happened had banks not switched at all. Okay, so we're going to use this as a benchmark if you want. The number, the answer is 0.7%, which is simply the share of users valuing total payments in Fedwire. And uh, this this may mean this may seem small, but uh, you know we know that in payment systems uh, there is large concentration in terms of the value of payments uh, from uh, for, for uh, G6. Um, we find that the responses by the official and private sectors cut this effect almost by half, okay? Especially on the first day of the event when the disruption was more severe. And as a matter of fact, I can uh, push forward this argument here and try to decompose the responses of the official sector, try to quantify the response of the official sector and the private sector separately. So on the left here, I uh, rerun the regressions by excluding the extensions in the trading day granted by the Fed. And what we find is that the effect on the first day would have been half percent compared to this 0.42% uh, that I showed you earlier that includes these extensions uh, in the trading day. And on the right, uh, we rerun the regressions by excluding the restoration efforts by the TSP, which were material toward uh, the, uh, the end 
of the event. And what we find is that the effect on the last day of the event essentially will have been the same as on the first day of the event. You see that the economic significance is essentially uh, the same. So taken together, this evidence suggests that uh, the uh, actions and the steps, both by the official sector, the central bank, as well as the private sector, uh, the banks themselves, as well as the TSP, help mitigate the impact of cyber attacks. Let me just uh, go quickly to the uh, second and third round effects. If there is a second round effect, that should be on non-users of the TSP uh, themselves that are on the receiving end of those payments. And again, we're interested in two questions. The first one, was there a drop in payments non-users received? This is a second round effect. And if so, how did these guys respond to the liquidity shortfall? Did they send fewer payments themselves? So this is the third round effect. We run our models, we find that incoming payments of receiver banks dropped, especially on the first day of the event when disruption was more severe. And consistent uh, with, with uh, the evidence I showed you earlier, the drop was less severe on subsequent days, okay? How did receiver banks address the liquidity shortfall? What we find is that small receiver banks were more likely to borrow from the discount window, especially those with no alternative sources of funding, meaning that their Fed funds borrowing was zero, and especially those with relatively few reserves, okay? So to put it differently here, if you're a small bank with no access to the interbank market and you have relatively few reserves, then we find that this bank is gonna go to the, uh, is, is more likely to borrow from the discount window. How about large banks? Those large uh, uh, receiver banks with more reserves relied on those reserves, especially on the first day of the attack when disruption was more severe, while the rest of the large receiver banks increased uh, borrowing from the interbank market, especially those with relatively few reserves. And taken together, we find that these responses were sufficient to avoid a third round effect and broader financial uh, instability. Let me just uh, provide um, uh, some policy lessons here uh, as a, as a uh, concluding uh, remark. First of all, official and private sectors uh, responses do matter. Uh, bank users switched to alternative methods in sending payments, which allowed them to send payments after business hours using Fed's extension of the trading day. However, uh, they did not switch to them quickly enough in order to avoid uh, contagion. As a result, bank non-users on the receiving end of those payments had a material drop in payments received. We also find that the restoration of services by the TSP helped mitigate some of these uh, effects. The second policy lesson here is that liquidity buffers matter. Banks non-users with sufficient reserves relied on those reserves to make their own payments, while the rest, uh, they had to borrow funds either from uh, the Fed or from the interbank market. And we know that when you borrow funds, essentially this has an opportunity cost. Finally, central bank support uh, matters. Uh, we find that the traditional tools that the central bank has um, are effective in mitigating the impact of non-traditional shocks, such as cyber attacks. And in this particular case, we find that the Fed, by extending, by injecting time to the system, mitigated the first round effect, and by injecting liquidity to the system, uh, mitigated the second round uh, effect. Uh, this uh, concludes my uh, presentation, and I look forward to uh, the discussion and any questions. Thank you so much. Wow, that was fast. So um, Andreas didn't have to raise any sign. So Jakob, the floor is yours. So who would be a better discussant for such a paper than somebody who is in charge of looking at risks in the EBA? <laughs> so the expectations are sky high at that moment. <laughs> Jakob Lüntelberg from the EBA. Here we go. So um, thanks for the... <laughs> anyway, thanks for inviting me, right? I think it's excellent to have a, a research conference here. I think it's, it's about time. So well done for the organizers. And thanks for inviting me. Now, so let me... Um, see if I can do this, right? So just to be clear, I, I think this is an excellent paper, right? In a sense, um, it's reassuring, right? We have a, a good small example, but big enough to learn from, but not big enough to break the system. So we've got to be thankful for the opportunities that nature provides here, right? Now, so basically, I'm not gonna do this recap, but it's on the slide, right? I just think, for me, this is exactly what I would think would happen. Right. There's nothing surprising in this. It's kind of comforting to see, okay. And, and as I think Anthony said, look, the, the Fed tools were pretty effective in mitigating the impact on the liquidity side for the system. Yeah. Now, okay. But then, you know, what does that mean? Well, for me, just in terms of critiquing the paper very quickly, right? It's, this is a pretty unique case study. Now, I know having worked 
on the evil capitalistic side for a while. There are many other examples where there are cyber attacks that have impacts on banks and the system, right? I think the lesson here would be, it'd be good to see more examples, particularly the ones that are now a little bit old, but still relevant, right? So for those of us who know, maybe there's an obligation to try and bring them out in the nice way as is done here, yeah? Um, I think it's clearly relevant as we're moving into a much more computer-based digital payments world, right? We have, there's an awareness in Europe, we have legislation coming, right? We have DORA coming down the path, we have new entrants coming in. So there's a whole movement on the technology side here, which at least from my perspective has mostly already happened, but there's no doubt more to come. So it's highly relevant, right? I think, uh, again, one of the strengths, very simple, very clear graphs are elegant, right? It's very easy to see what's going on. Regressions are understandable, right? They, no, no, not much bells and whistles needed here to make the point. Now, uh, what could be done, I think, usefully could be, could be to say, look, there's a few papers out now on theory that looks at spillover effects and network structures might be good to see some link to the to the newer theory, um, and I can I so, so uh, I I can I can give names on papers I'll send to the author. But there is a growing body of work that looks at this from a liquidity risk sort of spillover effect. It harks back to the olden days of Hirschstedt risk papers and whatnot. So there's a number of things. I know Philip has done work in this as well. So it's not all new, right? <laughs> so so I think maybe look at those theory papers and say where are we. What do we learn from this, right? Does it match what the models would suggest or are there lessons here? Um, I guess the other point I would make is now we have a, a third party being attacked, but how does that compare to own homemade messes by the banks? Well, it's the banks themselves that mess things up and are able to pay. Is there a big difference? What does that, how does that compare? And as I already said, if we could compare with other cases that might be helpful, to see if there are nuances we would take home, yeah? So that's basically my sort of, uh, my suggestions for the paper as is. Now, given that I'm here uh, in the hallowed halls of the supervision, right? Just let me take five more minutes to say, what are the wider implications here, right? Well, I think it's clear that it's important to maintain in-house hygiene. I think one of the points made is that this ability to recover and come back was a big part of what reduced the impact. You know, it's clear that we have a number of TSPs out there that look a bit like the ones shown, and they're all out there, and they can have the same impact on preventing payments from being made, right? So I think this is another point to make, that maybe this one TSP is not that special, even though it looks at the Fed wire system. There are many other examples of third-party providers that have key roles in payment systems, yeah? Again, what are the other lessons learned? Well, business continuity, recovery plans make a difference, right? Recovery not in the ending the bank, but in being able to come back, have a secondary way to transmit money matters, right? Again, I think what we also learn is it's important to see what are the liquidity impacts here, right? The Fed did have to step in, step in. There was a need even for larger banks to get extra cash, yeah? So there's also a lesson, right? And I wonder if there are any financial market implications of this. Is this if this had an impact wider out into to, in addition to what the banks did in the in this sort of narrow Fed wire system, did this have an impact on other things they did? Yeah, I don't know, but I think it could be there. Now, what does that mean for us? Well, there's clearly a perimeter question, right? If I could say like that. So here, I would say the main lesson for me is we need to know what the network look like, looks like, who's out there, what, what is the structure of the ecosystem that we have? Because if we don't know the structure of the ecosystem, we don't really know what's at risk here, who are actually the critical TSPs out there, like the one that, that was demonstrated here in the paper, right? So for me, there's a definite need to take a lesson here and say, look, we did that back in 08, when we started mapping out the global financial system with a bit more focus on interconnectedness, here it seems to me that this is a, an obvious thing to start doing, right? Again, I would say our view on stress testing, given my current job, is also, look, of course we need to think about 
operational stress testing, cyber stress testing, liquidity stress testing as, as linked together, right? You can't just treat it as a separate issues, right? They are probably the same short-term, highly linked set of issues we need to address, and we probably need to get going, right? And I would say here, I, you know, are we doing enough war games? Yeah, have we practiced this? Are the banks practicing this? If not, they should, because it's clearly something that matters. That's it. Thank you. So questions from the floor. Hi, um, Martin Oemke from the London School of Economics. Um, Slightly outside of this paper, but I think something that this paper uh, makes me think about is um, uh, extrapolating and thinking about the incentives of, say, the technology service providers or other involved parties to invest um, in cybersecurity. How should we think about that, and how should bank supervision uh, uh, or cybersecurity supervision, I don't know, think about that? Um, and I wonder whether, you know, what you found in the incident that you looked at um, gives any uh, guidance for that. Thank you. Um, Jean-Edouard Collier from HEC Paris. Um, I like this topic a lot. I think it's very relevant. I was wondering, I mean, in a sense, maybe this cyber attack, fortunately, was targeting a point in the system that is maybe not that weak. So I was thinking, you know, are there concerns that instead of attacking the, the flows, like the payments, people could attack the, the stocks, like, you know, the registers where we keep information and who owes what to whom. And, and so because if this information gets destroyed, then, you know, this is a whole different mess, I guess. And I was also wondering what about the connections between the banks and the central banks? Because here, you know, the, the banks could still operate with the Fed. And so, you know, it's, it's reassuring, but not very surprising to see that then when you still have access to the lender of last resort, all goes well. But what if this particular infrastructure is targeted? Is the Fed thinking about that? So I would be curious to know your views. Thank you. OK, Antonis, you want to answer to your discussant and the three questions that were asked? Yes. So uh, first of all, many thanks, Jacob, um, um, for, for this great discussion and, and the questions. Let me just, um, a couple of things I have kept note here. So your suggestion to connect it to theory a little bit better. Uh, we have some theoretical papers in the in the literature review, uh, but I, I agree with you, we can do better. Um, so I will be reaching out to you uh, to share this uh, literature that you that you mentioned. I think we can do better on that on that end. Um, I think one one comment uh, in the discussion was, uh, was uh, what if banks were attacked directly? Well, so here's the thing, like. In this case, the TSP was impacted, and banks were indirectly essentially impacted because the TSP uh, went offline. Like I said, banks were able to switch to alternative ways to in, in sending payments. But if if a bank is is directly attacked, they will not be able to do so. Okay, so the effect, if anything, uh, would have been like way larger because um, uh, banks wouldn't have been able to. Uh, switch to alternative ways in, in sending payments. And this goes back to your first point, um, uh, Jacob, that we need more examples. Yes, we need more examples. We need more examples that not only TSPs are impacted. Uh, we need examples that um, uh, banks, key players, are impacted, even, um, even though the impact is not, uh, you know, if, even if it is like a long, hours long uh, event. You know, we need to understand a little bit better how uh, uh, banks, uh, how prepared they are, and what we, the central bank, uh, can do in order to mitigate um, the, the, the uh, effects. Uh, there was another point in the discussion about uh, we need to understand what the network uh, looks like. I, I, I can't agree more on this, frankly. Like, the extent to which the system is digitally interconnected, I'm afraid like it remains completely in the dark. Okay, mainly because of lack of data. But uh, you know, we know from the past that when, when we don't understand something, sooner or later it's gonna bite us back. Um, so this digital interconnectedness, I think it is it is a key point. Uh, or if you want a concentration risk, there are some key uh, players um, uh, in the in the in this market. And a whole set of questions arise: Are they supervised? Who supervised them? Or maybe if they're not supervised, maybe we should, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. 
Uh, on the questions from the from the audience, let me start from the uh, last question. The connections from the, the bank has with the central bank. So essentially, here a very a very dark scenario is like, what if the central bank itself is under a cyber attack? Uh, because then you don't have the lender of last resort. You don't have the um, the coordinator of last resort because essentially when the Fed extends the trading day, essentially coordinates reserves uh, among banks and in their master accounts. So this is a very uh, dark scenario. I'm not sure I want to think what uh, would happen uh, in this case, but um, it is a scenario that, uh, you know, um, some people are, are thinking of. Uh, finally, the, um, the TSP and um, its incentive to invest in, in cybersecurity. Yeah, so, I mean, this is a classic principal agent problem, right? Like if, I, if, if I'm a bank and I essentially uh, delegate this, the whole, my whole cybersecurity defense to another company, uh, what is the, the optimal investment of this, uh, of this TSP on, on cybersecurity incentives? I mean, there are a couple of theory papers which I'm happy to share with um, uh, the, whoever asked the question. Uh, there are a couple of theory papers, actually Tony, Tony Arnold, who is at ECB, has a very nice paper on this. Uh, and, the, and they study the incentives of, the, of these uh, TSPs, these players, to invest in cybersecurity in the presence of this, um, of this delegation. Thank you very much. If there are no further questions, definitely an area where we need to see much more research, in particular much better data to, to, to understand better the systemic risks that may be associated with those, those developments.